afternoon to everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today um, for our virtual special collection ZSR library program dedicated to our rare book collection. I'm Tanya Zanish Belcher, Director of Special Collections, and we're pleased to have you here today. This Zoom webinar is being hosted with the technical assistance of Rebecca Peterson May, our public services archivist. Thank you, Rebecca. I also have, we also have an upcoming program I would like to share. We will be hosting both an in-person and live streamed event on November 1st, which is a Tuesday from three to four. Professor Margaret Peggy Supley, Supley Smith will be speaking about her new book, Great Houses and Their Stories, Winston-Salem's Era of Success, 1912 to 1940, as our inaugural speaker in the Sam Gladding Wake Author Series. A reception will follow for those of you coming to ZSR. If you are interested in live streaming Peggy's presentation, please let us know at archives at wfu.edu. We will post the address in the chat in case you need to need it. And once you are registered, we will send you the link. I would also like to thank and acknowledge the donors who make these programs possible, specifically Kathy and Andy Liverman from the class of 77 and other ZSR Board of Visitor members. Their support has allowed us to expand our outreach events like this to a much broader audience. Some housekeeping items. Today's program will be coming to you via Zoom webinar. Once Megan's presentation is over, you will be able to submit your questions in the chat and she will respond to them. This presentation is being recorded and we will make it available on our YouTube channel as soon as we can. And now for the main event. Our speaker today is Megan Mulder. Megan is the Special Collections Librarian and Rare Books Curator at Z. Smith Reynolds Library, and she joined SCA in 1991 as a graduate intern. She received her MA in English Literature from the University of Virginia and MS in Library and Information Science from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. In her current role, she collaborates with Wake Forest faculty in all divisions to integrate special collections material into their curriculum, and she also oversees collection development and cataloging and metadata for rare materials. Her presentation today will be based on an exhibit she's curated, currently on display in our research room, room 625 ZSR Library, titled Never Before Published, First Editions from the Wake Forest Library Rare Books Collection. The exhibit will be available for the public to see through January 31st during our open hours of Monday through Friday, 10 to 4. Just a brief description. In book collecting circles, the mystique of the first edition is impossible to ignore. But what is a first edition anyway? Are they really more desirable or interesting than later editions? And what, if any, is their research value? This exhibit and Megan's presentation presentation today will answer those questions with examples of first editions from the 16th through the 20th centuries from authors including Jane Austen, Phyllis Wheatley, Charles Darwin, Walt Whitman, Maya Angelou, and many others. Megan, you are up. Thank you, Tanya, um, and welcome, and thanks to everyone who's joining us here this afternoon. I am actually, I'm, I'm in my office, not in the research room because um, the um, the Wi-Fi there was a little wonky. So I'm, I'm broadcasting you adjacent to the, the exhibit, but it is nearby. And hopefully those of you who are local, if you get a chance, will have a chance to come and see it in person. But since you've all voluntarily, I assume, signed up for this talk, I'm assuming that everyone has some interest in or curiosity about books and first editions. Um, but if you're not a librarian or an active collector, as Tanya said, you may have some questions. So my goal in the next hour or so is to answer some of the main questions that I tend to get about first editions, um, while also taking a closer look at some of the books featured in this exhibit. And then we'll have some time at the end for you to, answer, to ask any questions that I don't answer in the talk. So here. So the three general questions I'm going to address are, first of all, what is a first edition? What even are we talking about here when we talk about first editions? Second, why should we care? Why do people collect first editions? What's, what's special about them? Um, and finally, what is the research value of first editions to an academic library like ours? 
So the broadest definition of a first edition is this. A first edition is a copy of a book in the format in which it was first made available to the public. So these are three examples of kind of random first editions um, from, from the current exhibit. It's not showing you on the screen. Tell them you have a technical Oh, we're having technical difficulties. Just a minute, <laughs> Rebecca is going to help me. It's not showing us. Apparently the slideshow is not showing, which is not helpful. So I'm gonna I'm gonna get out again and see if we can make this work. It's showing like your your back view, not this view. No, that's not good. I would say talk amongst yourselves, but that might be a little <laughs> difficult. Might be hard. Well, well uh, hopefully this. Yeah, just make it. Just make it. Does that look any better? Or are you still seeing the back end? Yes, I see this. Okay, is it full screen? Yes. Okay, great. All right, that was as, as technical difficulties go. That wasn't too bad. Um, so now, hopefully, it's big enough that you can actually see. <laughs> these three um, first editions from um, from our collection and from this um, from this exhibit. Um, we have on the, on the far left here, we have a first edition of Dracula by Bram Stoker from 1897. Um, this has a very famous cover. Um, ours is a little bit dingy. I think it was a well-loved copy, but um, it's, it was it originally was very bright yellow with this sort of blood red um, lettering on it. So this is how people would have first encountered, you know, the, the you know, text of Dracula. Um, in the center, we have the um, first edition of Charles Darwin's Origin of Species from 1859. Um, this book was the result of many, many years of research um, by Darwin, but this is the first time that it was published. This was the first time that you know everyone could read his theories of um, natural selection. So it's a, a seminal work, a really important landmark work in the history of science. Um, and then on the far right, we have one that's a little surprising. It was to me when I first um, researched it. This is actually the first edition of Benjamin Franklin's autobiography. It was published in 1791 in Paris in French. Um, there were obviously more editions. He expanded it and published it in English. But the first time it, his memoirs were ever published was in, in French, which kind of reminds us of his ties to Paris and of the um, you know, the relationship between France and the newly created United States. So this is just three examples. These are all first editions. This is what these books look like the first time they were made available um, for public sale. Now, obviously, you can get a lot more complicated when talking about first editions, and I will not go there because we don't have time or, or interest. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on that, but I do want to make one kind of explain a little bit one important distinction, um, and that is between books of the hand press period and later mass produced books. So this is a really condensed timeline. I'm going to give you a like a two minute history of, of printing in Europe. And I should also point out here that all the books we are talking about in, in the exhibit and talking about today are European or North American. Um, that reflects our legacy collections, basically. Um, and also the fact that the history of books in Asia and in other parts of the world are, are quite distinctive and follow a very different timeline. So we are just talking about Europe. We're just talking about the West, Europe, and North America here. So this is the basic timeline of um, printing in Europe as it happened. The manuscript period was pre mid 15th century, then around 1450, Johannes Gutenberg um, developed a system for printing with movable type. And that was in place for about 400 years until the beginning of the 19th century. Then with the Industrial Revolution, um, books were still printed with kind of metal type, but a lot of the processes were mechanized and streamlined. And then finally, by the end of the 20th century, um, you know, books obviously are stored on computer files um, and, and printed that way. So that has implications for what we mean by an edition or first edition. Um, Pre-printing, you know, so pre-1450, there's not, there's, there's, there's really no such thing as an edition of a book because each book was handwritten. Each book is unique. Um, so if anyone ever tries to tell you, you know, that they have a first edition of a medieval manuscript, um, that, that basically makes no sense. They don't know what they're talking about. So you should run the other direction. There are no editions. Each book is, is just a unique copy. 
It's with the advent of printing from movable type that we get into the period where book editions become a thing. So during the hand press period, again, roughly 1450 to the 1830s, um, books were printed by hand and type was set by hand. And you see here on the left, these are a couple of students from a couple of years ago in our um, history of the book class um, setting type in um, our, our printing lab with Craig in the background there. Um, and this is how type would be set for, for basically all books during this period. Um, you can see there they've got these wooden cases of letters and each you know little compartment has a different letter or punctuation mark or something. And you know you would have a, a page of text that you wanted to print, and you would sit and print, pick out each individual letter and set it um, into a, a frame of, of type that's ready to be printed. Um, on the right here, um, you can see a, a, a page, kind of a small, um, um, just a broadside that's um, a page of set type to print on our little well, ZSR letterpress. Um, so that's how books that's how books are printed. Um, the important thing to know is that for the vast majority of books, for almost all books, the type, the individual letters um, would be redistributed, like that is put back into their little wooden cases for other projects once the required number of pages for an edition were published. So if you want to print 500 copies of whatever book you're printing, you would print those copies and then you would take apart all the type. In fact, probably as you were in the process of printing, you would print the first, you know, 50 pages, and then you would already be redistributing the type for printing later pages. You, you, very few people could keep what's called standing type, like all these pages, like set up and ready to reprint more copies of. Um, that's because the type fonts, these sets of type were very expensive. So you, very few print shops could afford them. You know, you would, so you would run out of ease before, you know, you got to the end of, of your 200 page book. Um, so the individual letters would be put back into their boxes after the printer had printed however many pages they wanted of the given text. What that means is that if another edition was required, the type would have to be completely reset. Here's an example. This is our first edition of Pride and Prejudice, published in 1813. It's, it, was, it, was, it was a hand-pressed book. Um, it was printed in an edition probably of about 800 copies, which was typical of a, a fiction um, run at that point by a not yet particularly well-known author. Um, but it sold quite well, actually. Those 800 copies sold out, um, and the public demanded more copies. So at that point, the, the publisher had to start from scratch again. They had to reset all the type um, in order to print more copies. So when we refer to books from this hand press period before you know the early 19th century printed on a hand press, a first edition is defined as all of the copies of the book printed from that first setting of type. And then a second edition is all the copies printed from the second setting of type and so on and so on. Sometimes there could be substantial changes from one edition to another. Um, sometimes they were very similar, but since each edition represented a new setting of type, there are always some at least minor differences to distinguish them. So in the 19th century, as the 19th century wore on, like I said, a lot of processes got mechanized and one thing that happened was that books began to be published from stereotype plates. And this is kind of a bad um, image of one, but it gives you an idea of what it looks like. Basically, the type would be set. Um, you would make a cast from the, the, the set type, and then you would make a metal plate from that cast. Um, these could be used, these could be basically stored. These were kind of flat, so they could be stored in a warehouse and used again and again for multiple identical editions. So the difference between a first and a second edition became less distinct because they were, you know, for all intents and purposes identical. You know, the type would get a little bit worn out with later editions, but they were they were very much the same. Um, and of course, by the end of the 20th century, with books stored as computer files, they can be, you know, now reproduced on demand in various formats. So for modern books, distinguishing between editions is less about textual variants, although they sometimes can occur. Um, and it tends to be more about packaging and format. Like is it a hardcover? Is it a paperback? Is it an ebook or a movie tie in edition? That's that's kind of how you um, how you distinguish different editions. Example of, of a modern first is um, this book from the exhibit. This is my first edition of Maya Angelou's I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings from 1969. So this is what the dust jacket looked like. This is the cover of the dust jacket, kind of an iconic design. Um, and then on the back, it's it's interesting to to read this because the text. I don't know if you can see it. It's kind of small, but it's basically the text is 
introducing Maya Angelou to the reading public. It pretty much assumes that probably most of the people who pick up this book in a bookstore haven't heard of her. She wasn't a, a huge public figure at that point. So it's telling you a little bit about her, telling you why you might want to read the book. You can contrast this with a later edition from our collection. This is a, an edition of the same text from 1997. You can see the packaging is very different. This is the front cover. Um, and um, so it's got it's got you know a picture of Maya Angelou on the front cover. Um, it's got New York Times bestselling author. Her name is you know huge up on top. It's bigger than the title. So not only is it not you know feel like it has to tell you who Maya Angelou is, it's sort of assuming that the whole reason you're buying this book is because you know who Maya Angelou is and you want to read this book. So that's that tends to be kind of um, that this is the type of detail that tends to distinguish modern first editions. Um, now, bibliographic purists would sometimes say that when you're, if you're, unless you're talking about the, the hand press period, first editions don't actually mean anything. And there's an argument to be made for that. But the general, you know, the general use of the term um, encompasses modern firsts also. Um, but even for books printed in the hand press period, um, one edition, determining what, you know, constitutes one edition or another is not always completely straightforward. Um, this, for example, is a first edition of John Milton's Paradise Lost from the exhibit. Um, and Paradise Lost was first printed and sold in 1667. Now, the eagle eyed among you may notice that the date on this title page is 1669. So why is this in our exhibit? How is this a first edition? Well, there's a story behind it. So in 1667, Milton had kind of fallen on hard times. He was you know, over 60 years old, he was blind, his politics were kind of you know, out of fashion and he needed money. So he sold the manuscript of Paradise Lost to this publisher, Samuel Simmons for five pounds, which was a reasonable amount of money at the time. Um, Simmons then printed a print run of 1500 copies, which was a, a fairly large print run for you know, an epic poem. But Paradise Lost did not sell well in its first outing. Um, and Simmons was left with a lot of unsold copies, these stacks of basically just unbound sheets. Um, and so in an attempt to recoup some of his investment, he tried to reissue the book several times over the next few years by packaging the original 1667 pages with updated title pages, and in some cases, additional preparatory material. Um, in our copy, for example, there's an added argument of several pages, which just is what we would call probably just an introduction. Um, it's, it includes like a prose summary of what's going on in each section of the poem to kind of help orient people. And um, I don't know if you can see up here at the top, um, the printer to the reader little note. Um, he, he talks about what he's doing and then specifically addresses what apparently was a, a common criticism that he got from readers, which he says is why the poem rhymes not. Um, which I always think is kind of, uh, of entertaining. Even, even before, you know, Amazon um, commentary, um, th there was still, re readers still made their opinions known. And the opinion apparently in this case was, um, I paid three shillings for this book and it doesn't even rhyme. So he had Milton give his, you know, explanation of why, why he decided to use blank verse, which has itself become, you know, very important um, text for understanding Milton. Um, so this argument on the left here, this section was added later. And then on the right, you see the first page of text and that would have been printed in 1667. So that is officially part of the first edition. Um, so despite the fact that the date on the title page is two years after it was first sold and made available to the public, it's still considered a first edition because the text is from the first setting of type. Um, the technical term is first edition later issue. Another example of sort of a complicated first edition is from the 19th century, which um, saw an explosion of different publishing formats for published popular literature. Charles Dickens, the, probably the best-selling English author of the 19th century, um, really pioneered publishing in different ways, especially the publishing of his novel linked fiction in bi-weekly installments. It was called publishing in parts. Um, this meant that the text was first published in these little booklet, booklets every other week. Um, they usually contained two chapters at a time. Here's some more of them. Um, this is David Copperfield, obviously. Um, so they were be published bi-weekly over, over the course of several months. 
this was a terrific marketing ploy. It kept the audience hooked. Um, and it also allowed for sale of advertising space. So in addition to buying the text, um, the, the publisher could sell advertising space. So you see all sorts of ads in these, in these, um, in these parts. Um, some of them are for other books, but a lot of them are just from, you know, stuff, hair gel, clothes, um, coffins, all sorts of things. Um, so from a marketing perspective, it was a great, it was a great idea. And then after all of the parts had been published, <coughs> the publisher would issue the complete novel in book form, so like a box set. So there was another chance for them to sort of make money. Since if people particularly liked the book, they might want to buy, you know, it in book form. So for David Copperfield and many other Victorian books that were published in parts, there is a first edition in parts and a first monograph edition. Um, as you might expect, the parts tend to be harder to come by, even though sometimes there were, you know, more copies of them originally printed. But they're they're fragile, being you know just these little paperback um, um, publications. Um, and also maybe considered kind of disposable by their original owners, um, so they didn't always get saved. So you might have the first book edition of a Dickens novel, like this David Copperfield, but that might not actually be the form in which it was first available for purchase. So it's the first you know, monograph edition, but it's not the first edition in parts. Um, so while the definition of a first edition is fairly straightforward, as we can see just from these two examples, the individual examples can sometimes be kind of complicated. So our second question is, what is the big deal about first editions? Why do people collect first editions? Why are they generally more expensive or desirable than other editions? Why does the you know assigned first edition of The Hobbit get $120,000 at auction, whereas a signed you know, fourth edition might only get $50,000? Um, why, 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 why is it better? Um, and when did this interest in first editions begin? So the when part is sort of the easiest to answer. Um, book collecting in its modern form really became a thing in the mid to late 19th century. Um, on the left here, you see an illustration, a frontispiece from one of, one of our many, many 19th century guides to book collecting, um, an antiquarian book um, dealing. Before that, people, of course, had amassed libraries, um, you know, because they actually wanted to read the books or, you know, just in order to appear well read or because they like you know, these particular books or whatever, for whatever reason. But this obsession with getting the earliest edition of any title um, had its beginnings in the antiquarian movement of the 18th century and really came into full flower kind of in the mid 19th century. Um, then and now, kind of the more cynical people dismissed this obsession with first editions as just a marketing ploy by antiquarian booksellers trying to draw in rich but not particularly knowledgeable collectors who you know were maybe jumping on the book collecting bandwagon. Um, and this could be true and they weren't some, sometimes they weren't always you know completely um, on the up and up. Um, and it's true that by the late 19th and early 20th century, book collecting had become sort of a fad among rich people, especially newly rich people who were eager to prove that they were cultured. Um, and sometimes they fell for scams. On the right here, you see a, what, a, what purports to be um, a first edition pamphlet by Charles Dickens. It is actually a forgery by a rather famous 19th century forger named Thomas Wise, um, who kind of deserves a whole presentation of his own, so I won't get into it. But there were, you know, since since first editions became desirable, obviously there were scammers who were trying to um, take advantage of this and still are for that matter. Um, but this was the era, era of collections that became some of the great private research libraries in the US, like the Folger, the Huntington, and the Morgan Library. Um, so it was, you know, it was, it was rich white men who were financing these, you know, very, very large collections. And they did not generally spend their free time rummaging around in the back rooms of bookstores. Um, they had personal librarians to oversee and develop their collections. And if you participated in the community read here in um, Winston-Salem um, and read the biographical novel about J.P. Morgan's librarian, Belle de Costa Green, you're familiar with this. Um, they would also have buying agents who would find books for them. Um, and these agents did kind of have a vested interest in promoting first editions as particularly desirable and collectible. In the US, there was also the Grolier Club, which was and, and still is, it still exists, a New York organization for book collectors. Um, and the Grolier Club 
put out a number of sort of checklists of what they considered to be important books in various areas. Um, this is the 100 books famous in English literature. There were 100 books famous in American literature and various other grow your guides. Um, and collectors would often use these as guides for their collecting. They would try to collect all of the 100 books famous in, in English literature and amass that as a collection. So these books, books listed, which were almost always first editions, became very desirable. So Charles H. Babcock, whose um, book plate you see on the right, um, was one such collector. And we have um, his collection here in uh, here at Wake Forest um, in special collections. Um, Babcock married R.J. Reynolds' daughter, Mary, and became an executive at the R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company. Um, he and Mary lived in, the, lived in and renovated Renolda House. So if you visited Renolda House, you've seen some of his other books on the shelves there. Um, and he was a member of the Grover Club and collected a lot of books from their lists. Our first edition of Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre is one of Charles Babcock's books um, from his collection. In a lot of ways, it's sort of typical of an early 20th century book collector's first edition. Um, it's the best known of Bronte's work. Um, Babcock didn't have other novels in his collection. He and other collectors tended to collect what we would call high spots. Um, so, you know, you collect Jane Eyre, a first edition of Jane Eyre, and maybe a first edition of Wuthering Heights, but you wouldn't, you know, necessarily go on and want to collect the, the more minor works of the Brontes. Um, and it is this, the, our, our copy is in its original three volumes, but you can see that it has been rebound in very fancy leather with lots of gold decoration. This is not what it looked like, you know, when it was originally sold. Um, but this is another thing that wealthy collectors would often do, um, because to be honest, they were often more concerned about the books looking impressive on their shelves rather than necessarily preserving them as artifacts. That wasn't their, um, their main goal. But one nice thing about whoever, um, had this rebound, we're not sure if it was Babcock or a previous collector, um, but they at least saved the original cloth from the original binding of the first edition. Um, so you can see what the actual first edition of the book would have looked like. It's just this very plain brown cloth with the um, title on the spine. Um, so you can imagine that it looks, it looks very different than the, from the fancy, you know, fancy leather. Um, so again, this is a typical collector's item, probably purchased by Babcock, you know, maybe because it was on a list of grow your books. Um, this sort of prestige was one of the main reasons that people collected first editions. Um, it was kind of the idea that, you know, if having old books was good, then having the oldest possible edition of everything, you know, was the best. And of course, you know, if you were building an impressive book collection, you wanted the best editions. But there's also more substantive arguments sometimes given um, kind of in defense of collecting first editions and high spots. And that was that the theory that the first edition of a book was most likely to be the closest manifestation of the author's vision for their work. That, you know, the author was maybe more involved in its production that, in a way that they wouldn't necessarily have been for later editions. Um, and this is sometimes true. One example is our first edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. Um, it was first published in 1855 when Whitman was a still quite unknown poet. It was literally self-published. Um, Whitman had previously worked as a printer's assistant, and he had two friends who owned a printing shop who agreed to, to print it for him. Um, so Whitman designed the book himself and probably helped with the typesetting and the actual printing, which was unusual. Um, but it's important because the book is very unusual in its design. Um, you can't tell from this picture, but it's a larger format than a normal book of poetry would have been. Um, it has this, you know, fancy green botanical design um, on the binding. a large format from this photograph. Um, and the text too is, um, is unusual um, for its layout and its different line breaks. Um, so for this particular first edition, the author's hand is definitely in, in evidence and that's a significant thing. But it's not always clear that a first edition of a book is the closest thing to the author's you know, intent. Another famous first in our exhibit is Edmund Spencer's epic allegorical poem, The Fairy Queen. 
The first edition, which was published in 1590, is sort of famous for having a lot of weird design issues. Um, there are several pages of dedications to wealthy and important figures in Elizabethan England, people like Walter Raleigh, um, which is normal. But these pages are at the end of the first volume instead of at the beginning of the book, as one would expect them to be. Um, and then on the left here, you see this is on the back side of the title page of the first edition. Um, and it's what looks like a kind of a, a hastily printed um, dedication to the queen herself, to Queen Elizabeth. Um, you couldn't have a more prestigious patron than the queen. So it's odd that this seems to be have kind of thrown in almost as an afterthought. There are a number of theories as to why this and other printing anomalies occur in the Fairy Queen first edition. Um, it's possible Spencer you know, didn't get permission to dedicate his work to the queen until the last minute because you had to have, you couldn't just dedicate it to somebody, you had to have their permission. Um, so maybe he didn't get this permission until after printing was underway and then the lesser dedicatees had to be shoved to the back. We don't know. But at any rate, if you compare the first edition with on the right here is the dedication page from 1596 second edition. Um, it's hard to argue that Spencer, you know, would have preferred the first edition. Um, I'm sure the, the, you know, the second edition with this, you know, very fancy shaped printing um, was more what he had in mind when he printed this book. So you can't assume, basically the takeaway is, you can't assume that just because something is a first edition, that it represents the best form of the text or is closer to the author's intent. Which brings us to our last question, which is what then is the research value of first editions in an academic library collection? Um, you know, if they're just prestige collector's items, then why should we continue to put resources into purchasing them and preserving them? Um, which we still do. Special Collections is an active collection with a small budget line and an endowed fund. Um, this photo is from 1966, and it marks the beginning of the Rare Books collection as a separate collection at Wake Forest. Um, with Richard Murdoch here on the right, um, the newly hired first rare books librarian, rare books curator. Um, and this is the job that I have now. So we still have a rare books curator. So why do we still have a rare books collection and curator? So by way of answer, I'd like to talk about three first editions from our African-American women authors collection. All of them were acquired within the last probably 15 to 20 years. Um, and as we'll see, each of these books is both a text and an artifact that gives us important information about the authors and also about the historical and cultural context in which the book was created. So the first book I'd like to talk about is um, Poems on Various Subjects by Phyllis Wheatley, who was later Phyllis Wheatley Peters after she married John Peters. This first edition was published in London in 1773. Um, you may remember learning in your American Lit classes that um, Phyllis Wheatley was the first published African-American author, which is probably true. Um, she was brought to Boston on a slave ship as a small child, um, enslaved by the Wheatley family as a house servant. Susanna Wheatley, the mother, undertook to educate her and quickly recognized her intellectual gifts. Um, Philip began writing poetry as a teenager. Um, she would write sort of poems on demand for memorial poems and different, different poems. Um, and she published some poems in New England newspapers. In the early 1770s, she began to think about publishing a volume of poetry, and she was in negotiations with a Boston publisher, but he wasn't particularly enthusiastic. He was kind of dragging his feet. Um, and then her poems came to the attention of um, Selina Hastings, the Countess of Huntington, who was a wealthy English patron of abolitionist causes. Um, and she offered to finance the publication of her collection, po collected poems in London. So the book was published in London, which was actually better than being published in Boston anyway, because Boston at this point is still, you know, kind of a col colonial backwater, um, whereas being published in London was much more prestigious and meant that it would gain, the book would gain a much wider um, distribution. So looking at this first edition, many features give us insight into the cultural moment in which it was born. Actually, I'm going to go back here and talk a minute about one example, which is the frontispiece of Phyllis Wheatley. Um, it presents her as a very modest, civilized, you know, intellectual figure. She's she's had the book next to her. She's writing. She's sitting at a desk. Um, and this is very important to the abolitionist argument at the time, because proponents of the slave trade would claim that Black people were incapable of higher reasoning, sometimes that they even that they were a completely different species than white people. So portraying Wheatley as, you know, an educated and cultured author 
um, you know, was 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 a counter argument for this and an assertion that humanity was in no way dependent on skin color. Another interesting feature is the dedic the sort of introductory material in the first edition. It's also very telling. I don't know if you can see the the page on the left very well. It's hard to see it. There's a lot of bleed through from the the other side, um, but it is a it, it the the top says it's a copy of a letter sent by the author's master to the publisher. Um, and it is basically a testimonial from John Wheatley, who at the time of this publication still had Phyllis enslaved by his family um, and came in for um, a lot of criticism, actually from abolitionists for this fact, and they did eventually give her freedom. Um, but John Wheatley basically kind of gives her brief biography, gives an account of her accomplishments as a writer and kind of attests to the fact that yes, this is, this is something that she really did. Um, and then on the facing page um, is another whole page of um, a list of names of prominent white men of Boston from the governor, you know, the colonial governor on down, um, all of whom are willing to vouch for the fact that Whitley, Wheatley did in fact write these poems herself. The fact that there are two pages dedicated to this, you know, tells us that the, the, the people who are publishing this book and writing this book expected a certain kind of pushback. They expected critics to say, oh, this isn't fake news. She didn't actually write this. Other people wrote it for her. We don't believe it. Um, so that's, you know, you, you can tell by what gets what gets addressed and what doesn't get addressed, um, often how people expected, you know, a first edition to be received. And of course, the poems themselves, which we won't have time to get into here, but there are some of the few first person written records that we have from an, Amer an African American woman from this time period. So reading the poems in this first edition gives us a lot of important context that gets lost when you encounter maybe just one or two of the poems in a modern anthology, which is how I first read Phyllis Wheatley and how a lot of us probably first encounter her. The next book I wanna talk about was published at the height of the Civil War in 1861, um, and it's Harriet Jacobs' memoirs, um, Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, which was the first published autobiography by a woman who had escaped slavery. Um, Harriet Jacobs was born into slavery in Edenton, North Carolina, and eventually escaped to the North, but only after spending seven years in hiding in her grandmother's attic. So it's a very dramatic story. One thing that you may notice right away about the, the title page here of the first edition is that Jake, Harriet Jacobs' name does not appear anywhere on the title page. In fact, it doesn't appear anywhere in the book because she uses a, a pseudonym actually throughout the, her narrative. Um, probably in order to protect you know, family members who were at that point still enslaved. The name that does appear on the title page is that of Lydia Maria Child, who was a well-known white abolitionist, activist, and author. Um, and for many years, this led critics of the book to claim that it was a fictional narrative, that it was actually written by Lydia Maria Child, that it wasn't true. Um, it actually was not reprinted again until 1973. Um, so it wasn't, you know, it, it, it wasn't taken up at the time um, the way it is now. And it wasn't actually until the 1980s that archival research by historian Jean Fagan Yellen proved that it was a true account and that Harriet Jacobs was um, a historical person. But as we saw with Phyllis Wheatley nearly 100 years previously, you know, a book by a Black person, especially a Black woman, woman was thought to require you know, some sort of editing or introduction by a white person in order to be taken seriously. And finally, I don't know if you can see the two quotes um, kind of in the middle there, they're kind of small under the written by herself, um, but they're also significant in that they really emphasize that this book is aimed at white women. That was the target audience. Um, the, first, um, the first quote is, is attributed to a woman of North Carolina um, and it reads, Northerners know nothing at all about slavery. They think it is, it is perpetual bondage only. They have no conception of the depth of degradation involved in that word slavery. If they had, they would never cease their efforts until so horrible a system was overthrown. Jacobs believed that, and, and, and the people who helped her publish just believed that, that white women didn't have a true picture of the abuses suffered by enslaved women and that informing them of this would help the abolitionist cause. Our particular copy of this first edition um, has some interesting evidence of who originally purchased and read this copy of the book. Um, the original owner has written her name in the book. Her name is Abby Skillings of Effingham, New Hampshire. I haven't been able to find out a lot of biographical information about her, but we assume she was probably a young a girl or a young woman 
um, based on her signature and the fact that the that on the right here you see another clipping that she has pasted inside the book, which is kind of a, um, a children's religious poem. So this was probably owned by a you know a girl, a teenage girl, or a young woman. Um, and the ownership information is very interesting because it tells us that at least in this case, Jacobs's book was considered to be an appropriate thing for um, a young woman to read and to own, um, which is actually kind of surprising because if you read the book, you know that Jacobs gives a really quite frank account of the widespread sexual abuse of enslaved black women. But one of the things that our copy of the first edition tells us is that at least this one copy seems to have found its intended audience. Finally, the last books we're going to look at are two editions by the African-American poet and novelist Gwendolyn Brooks. Gwendolyn Brooks was one of the most influential American poets of the 20th century. She was the first Black author to win a Pulitzer Prize. And in 1945, she published her first collection of poetry, A Street in Bronzeville, um, with the major New York publishing firm of Harper and Brothers. She also published several later collections with Harper um, and gained wide acclaim. Um, but the books were, as one would expect, marketed for their majority white audience. Um, you can see it's a very sort of, you know, standard looking book. Um, the, um, the author, the, the author biography on, 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 the, on the back kind of, you know, assumes that again, that people have never heard of, of um, Wendelin Brooks. Um, it also has her sort of, um, attesting to her wartime patriotism, because this was published in 1945, you know, by encouraging people to buy war bonds, which had nothing to do, you know, with the content of her books. So Brooks was very successful with Harper and Brothers. Um, her work was read by both white and black readers, but as she became um, more active in the civil rights movement um, in the 1960s, she eventually left Harper and Brothers at considerable economic costs to herself um, in order to publish her work with black owned publishing houses. Um, in particular, Dudley Randall's Broadside Press. This is one example of a Broadside Press publication that's in our exhibit. Um, this is Brooks's poetry series, Riot, which was written in reaction to demonstrations that, in Chicago that had occurred after the assassination of Martin Luther King. Working with Black-owned publishers was important to Brooks not only because she wanted to support them, but also because it gave her more freedom in the content and design of her work. It's not likely that Harper Brothers would have published, you know, Riot at this time, and certainly not in this format with its illustrations. So this looked very um, different than uh, a publication with kind of a more mainstream publisher would have looked. We have many other first editions by Gwendolyn Brooks in the collection, and having this range of materials again pro provides, you know, historical context, not only of one writer's career, but also allows us to see kind of the changing landscape of African American arts and literature in the 20th century. Um, so we do still collect first editions here in special collections, but our collecting priorities are different from that of a private collector. Um, I'm not in any way, you know, bashing private collectors. We have some amazing collections um, here because of donations from, from collectors. Um, and really that's the great thing about book collecting is that you can, you know, you're collecting with your own funds, you collect whatever makes you happy. If you want to collect high spot first editions, you know, go for it or literally anything else. Um, but when I'm using Wake Forest funds and research resources, um, I have to consider some things that I wouldn't, you know, necessarily as a private collector. Um, I can't just buy things because I think they're cool and impressive. Um, they have to contribute to our mission of teaching and research. So any first editions that I purchase now need to fit in with specific collecting priorities, which are designed to either supplement our existing holdings or collect in new areas that support the Wake Forest curriculum. Um, the African American Women Authors Collection that we've looked at some some stuff from right now um, is a good example. It now includes materials, you know, from Phyllis Wheatley Peters to Maya Angelou and beyond. So it's a very robust collection. And also, I look beyond just first editions. Um, show you one more one more book because later editions of a text can be just as historically important as the first edition. So I'll end with these two books from the exhibit, which um, are a first and a second edition of Lyrical Ballads, which is a poetry collection edited by William Wordsworth, um, published in 1798 and 1800, respectively, the first and second edition. And this was the book that basically, you know, launched the English Romantic movement in the early 19th century. So not only Wordsworth and Coleridge, who published in this collection, but you know, Keats and Shelley and actually Byron and all of those people 
um, this is kind of the seminal work for that movement. So we have two copies of the first edition in the collection. This one, which is from the Babcock collection, and another one from the Oscar T. Smith collection, um, donated by two different collectors. And this type of duplication happens a fair amount with our early 20th century gift collections because a lot of these collectors were collecting the same titles. You know, they were all working off the Grolier list, so they all wanted a first edition of lyrical ballads, um, which is great. But we didn't have a second edition, which is actually just as important. Um, because it has a different selection of poems, and it also contains the first printing of Wordsworth's lengthy preface, which you can see here on the right, the first page of, um, which is a really important essay. It became just sort of really the manifesto for the English Romantics. So last year, when we received a donation from a Wake Forest alum, um, specifically to purchase something in honor of Dr. Ed Wilson, whose specialty is romantic poetry, um, I purchased this second edition which sort of complements the first editions that we already had in the collection. Having both editions to compare for us adds value to the collection. So we love our first editions, but we love them in the context of our broader collections. We love how they can be used in conversation with other materials and how they can bear witness to the culture of books and readers that existed when they were first published. And now, We'll take questions from you. And, and I'll leave you with this information too. Feel free to contact us if you have questions. Um, you can contact the department at archives at wfu.edu or you can contact me directly. You can go to our website for happenings and other information. Um, and if you are a local or if you're going to be in Winston-Salem before the end of January, um, please stop by and see all of these books and other ones in person in our exhibit. And now I'm gonna stop sharing. So that I can see any questions that we do. Um, let's see. Okay, in the Q and A. Oh, this is a good question. If you had room for one more first edition in the exhibit, what would you add? Well, I add, and this this always happens when I do exhibits, is that I, I first you know list all the, the books that I want to. Um, include and then I have to cut about half of them because we don't have a very large exhibit space. Hopefully soon we will have much more exhibit space. But um, but let's see, um, that is a good question. Um, on the first edition, um, we have a lot of sort of, um, you know, more modern first that kind of skewed this collection a little bit towards some of the older things, um, but some of the more, um, the, the, um, the newer, um, 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 poetry books would be really interesting. Um, things from our, we have a, um, a Black Arts Movement poetry pamphlets collection um, that has a lot of just really fascinating things. Some of them, you know, really well known and some not particularly well known. Um, those would be great. Um, my personal area of, of, of study back when I was in grad school was 19th century Victorian literature. So I had to, I had to dislodge a lot of um, Victorian um, books. So maybe one that I would add, I think I actually included our George Eliot um, collection, which was a lot of um, them were also published recently with um, with gift funds. Um, but she's she's one of my favorite authors. So maybe I would have she worn George Eliot in there. Um, are there any other questions coming in. Rebecca can tell me if I'm missing some. Uh, Tanya's asking me my favorite book. That's a terrible question um, to ask because that's like asking your, you know, your favorite child or something. Um, because I really like, you know, I like all of them. Um, I'm partial to one of the books that is in the collection is um, our um, first edition of um, another Jane Austen book, Jane Austen's Emma, um, which I really like because it is, we call it an association copy. So it is signed by um, um, Sarah Harriet um, Burney, who is the, the sister. This gets a little bit into the weeds of 18th century literature, but she's the half sister of Frances Burney, who is um, a, the most popular author of the 18th century, basically a very popular novelist. And it just shows the really interesting connections of you know the Bernie family with you know Jane Austen and and how kind of interconnected that that world really was um, of the time again it kind of 
that that's 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 what I love about first editions. You know, um, the the best thing is that they they are these just little artifacts of of information, not just you know a carrier for a text, but you know it will tell you things about the time, um, and that's one example of that. So that that's one of my faves. Um, the oldest first, what is the oldest first editions that we have? That's a good question. Um, I don't actually know the answer to that, um, offhand. It's probably one of our, um, in Canabula, which is a book published in the first, like, 50 years of printing between, like, 1450 and 1500. Um, I would have to do a little bit of research. It's, it gets a little murky there because, you know, that's the very early days of printing and it's not always clear, you know, what, um, what constitutes an edition or how many editions there are. Um, but, um, but probably one of those, um, I guess the Nuremberg Chronicle is, is, is the first edition. So that's always very cool. If you visited um, for a class or, you know, visited special collections, you, we, 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 we pull that out a lot because it's this really big book with lots of really impressive um, woodcuts. So, um, so that's fun. That might be, that might be, that's certainly one of our earliest um, first editions because that was published in 1493. So but yeah, good question. I'll have to, I'll have to dig around and, and find out for sure. Um, There's a question in Q and A. Do you know oh, okay. how many first oh. editions? Do you know how many first editions I are in the do. rare books collection? Do I know how many first editions? That is another question that I absolutely do not know the answer to. Um, yeah, that would be that would be interesting. I mean, a lot because you know a lot of the gift collections that we got, people were specifically collecting first editions. Um, so probably, I mean, you know hundreds. I mean, the other thing about first editions is there's there's a lot of books. Um, we have a lot of first editions that never had a second edition. Um, and, you know, that's one of the things, you know, when you talk about collecting, a first edition is only exciting, you know, generally if it also had, you know, maybe a second edition, because there are a lot of first editions of things that no one wanted to read or a very small number of people wanted to read. So people sometimes ask, you know, what's the, what's the rarest book in the collection? And it's probably a first edition of something, you know, some pamphlet from, you know, our, our 18th century, you know, Baptist historical collection, some little Baptist pamphlet published, you know, in North Carolina in about, you know, 50 copies uh, that, that, that no one else has, has holdings of. Um, so that's probably, you know, that, that, that's, a, that's a first edition. Um, it's not monetarily particularly valuable because it's a very kind of niche audience for it. Um, and, you know, and one thing also to remember is that every, you know, every book has a first edition. Um, you know, everything published has a first edition. There's always going to be a first edition. There's not always going to be a second or a third edition because sometimes a first edition is, is, is all of the number of copies that anyone wanted to read. Um, so we probably have, we have a lot of first editions. Um, only some of them would probably be classified as, you know, collectible, you know, first editions maybe. Um, book plates. Book plates are great. We have actually collections of book plates. That would be, that would be a, a, a great you know, exhibit someday. Um, so do we, do we welcome them? So we don't, I mean, you know, we don't paste book plates into our books anymore, obviously, because we don't want to, you know, do anything. Sometimes we'll lay in a book plate if it's a gift book or something. Um, you know, sometimes they're they're great. Sometimes they can give you really useful, you know, information about the provenance of a book. Um, other times they can cover up useful information about the provenance of a book, like a lot of the books that we, you know, that were originally in the general circulating stacks of the Wake Forest Library, you know, dating probably from the 19th century. Um, they would slap a book plate over, you know, an original inscription or something. So we, we kind of wish those weren't there because that's covering up something to do with the history of the book, other than the fact that it, you know, was part of Wake Forest Library, which we know that. Um, 
but generally, you know, if, if a book comes in with a book plate, it's interesting information about the history of that book. Um, and, and of course, book plates themselves can be very interesting, especially if they're custom designed. Um, you know, they can be really interesting kind of works of art, you know, in and of themselves, like the Babcock, you know, book plate, which he had designed specifically for him. Um, so that can be, you know, that can be very interesting. That can tell you something about the person that purchased and collected the book. Um, so I love book plates personally, but we don't, you know, we, we don't stick new book plates into, into the books. But if you like book plates, you know, go for it. Put them in your books. Let's see. Also, okay. between chat and question yeah, okay, from, now I'm in chat. Yep. Oh, question from the reading room. Okay, great. Um, do we have any book gift collections from women, or are all the book gift collections given or donated to Wake Forest from men? Well, I mean, the majority are from men, just because you know, throughout history, men have been the ones who've been the majority of people who buy things. Um, but we do have some, you know, we do have some collections from women. We have. Um, uh, some collections from women faculty. We have Germain Bray's um, French books, uh, which is interesting. Um, and we certainly have books that were owned by women. Um, and that's an interesting thing to study. You know, like the Harriet Jacobs is a good example. It's always interesting, especially pre 20th century. It's always interesting to see um, ownership marks from women in books because, like I said, women didn't have a lot of, you know, financial independence necessarily. So, um, and a lot of times, you know, the books that they were reading belong to their, you know, father or husband or brothers or some of the men in their life. So to see a book, you know, that has an actual woman's name in it, that she she was the, the primary owner of this book um, is always very, you know, very interesting. Um, but, um, but yeah, I would anticipate that going forward, we will probably have more gift collections from women collectors because that's, you know, much more of a thing um, now. And that, that will be very interesting. It'll be very interesting to see, you know, um, how that might change. Um, but also, you know, there's also the fact that it, it, even though, you know, maybe the official donor was a man, was Babcock, there may have been women involved, you know, like the, the J.P. Morgan story, there they may have been women very involved in shaping those collections. But, you know, as, as with a lot of things, it's sometimes harder to see um, their influence because they don't get necessarily recorded. Um, but I would say the majority, certainly the majority of, of, of book gift collections are from men, um, but, but not all. We have some women. That's a good question. And yes, we have time for, if anybody has one more collection of one more question, we probably have time for one more. Not. Okay. Um, and yes, well, I will, I will just, yet yeah, a reminder coming through in chat to register for Peggy Smith's talk. We also, if you are on campus, we have on October 28th, we are having an event dedicated to um, the 125th anniversary of the publication of Dracula. So you can see the first edition of Dracula and some other vampire related books and also take part in various you know, vampire related festivities. So definitely stop by if you are, if you're in the neighborhood or on campus. Um, and if you have other suggestions of topics that you would like us to to talk about. For those of you who know me, know that I am happy to talk at great length about about books um, or any other archival topics. So um, we would love to hear from you if you're if you're dying to hear on a, a, about a particular um, particular topic or a particular part of our collection that we haven't addressed. Um, please let us know. Um, 